Taxes are done. Now it's time for the refund. But for one Valley man, the refund never comes. Instead, every year he gets a giant bill, and it's because of one unbelievable case of identity theft. Tonight, ABC 15 investigator Dave Biscabing shows how millions of us are also at risk. <laughs> yes. This is Tony Chalikas and his fiance Holly. You don't have a lot of short sleeves that fit you right now. <laughs> and they're getting married in July. We've been engaged since uh, 2016. But their walk down the aisle will only be symbolic. Tony refuses to make it legally official. I can't let her sign the paperwork yeah, until this is done. And it's because of another man. This man, Jorge Campos Ramirez. It's a sensitive topic. We asked Tony about it separately. No, this isn't some messy love triangle. It's a tax triangle. One of identity theft that's messed with Tony's life for a decade. In a word, what's it been like trying to get this resolved? Hell, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. So how did this start? Well, in 2003, Tony lost his wallet. I was a dumb kid and I kept my social security card in my wallet. Then in 2006, during a traffic stop, Tempe police found Jorge Campos Ramirez had Tony's information on a payslip. When questioned, he said that that time slip card was his. Ramirez admitted to using Tony's name and social security number for work. He claimed someone sold him the information. Tony Chalikas is the victim of identity theft. Yes, absolutely. But Tony says it's not just Jorge Ramirez. At least 17 different people have my ID. 17? At least. There's a guy in California right now that ha is using it at a bar. People earning money using Tony's identity, but not paying enough taxes. The right. IRS seizing his bank yeah, accounts really and dumping him with huge bills. This one's for 9,000. Here's one for 25,000. That was 16. Here's one for 11, actually almost 12. And they want all this money right away. This is a nightmare. Yeah, it really is. Tony even has a lawyer, but for years they haven't made a dent getting anywhere with the IRS. They want their money. That's their interest. They yeah, they don't care about me. He may have a point, and here's where it gets scary. In this internal report, it says from 2011 to 2015, the IRS identified almost 1.1 million people who were employment-related identity theft victims, but those victims weren't notified. What fixes this for you? Honestly, uh, another social security number. Let me start over. A fresh start for him and his future wife. Until this gets solved, we can't really move on with the rest of our lives. The IRS won't discuss anyone's specific tax information, but we are trying to help Tony sort all of this out. We have him in contact with the staffs of John McCain and Jeff Flake's offices and a special tax IRS advocate. And if you've had the same problems as Tony, I want to know about it. My contact information is at the bottom of the screen. I'm Investigator Dave Biscoving, ABC 15. Uh, I, what she said was so key there. I'm not sure if you guys tracked that or not. She said, until this is solved, we can't move on with the rest of our lives. Uh, we're, we're in a series right now called Identity Theft. If you missed last week, um, it sucks to be you. Uh, it didn't get recorded. Uh, it was fantastic. Uh, it really was. God showed up. Uh, I'm sorry you missed it. Good talk. Uh, we'll try to record today. Hello, everybody watching online. Uh, you know, identity theft is one of, I think, personally, the most heinous crimes. It steals who you are and makes you out to be someone you are not. You tracking with me there? It, it steals who it is that you are and makes you out to be someone that you are not. Last week, we talked about power that has been stolen from us and how you can take it back. Um, this, this piece of identity that I want to speak to today, which has been stolen from far too many of us, is our faith. Um, that if, if I, if, I mean, I'm not going to, but should I die in Africa? Uh, <laughs> it's okay, Ma, I'm just saying. This is, like, this is one of those, like, should I die crossing the street things. It happens to any of us, right? Um, but should I die in Africa? I was like, oh, man, what, what is it that I want to leave people with. Um, and, and for me, it is live out a true faith. Um, 
For Jesus followers, man, the world has tried to make our faith into something that it is not. Uh, we, 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 and as a result of that, we, we make slight changes to how it is that we live out our faith. Because in the world that we live in, many people will, will brush us broad strokes and use terms like all Christians, they're, they're bigots, or all Christians, they're radicals, all Christians, you know, they're, they're haters. And so the temptation is, as a result of that, to take on a counterfeit faith, something that is just a little more palatable, something that is just a little more acceptable to the, in the broad scheme of things, a less true faith, a, a, more, a more private internal faith, which actually leaves us not being who it is that we truly are in our identity. And so I want to talk to you today about what James, the brother of Jesus, has to say about true faith. Now, he should know, prior to Jesus coming back to life uh, from the dead, after uh, dying in the most grisly, horrible way on the cross, and then having a spear jabbed into his side just to make sure that he was dead, and then buried and, and, and put into the tomb, when he rose back to life, his brother, his half-brother James must have been like, oh, crap. You know, you know, when your brother calls his own death and then calls his own resurrection and comes back to life, you got to eat some major crow, right? And so poor James eats major crow and then devotes the rest of his life as a result of seeing his brother raised from the dead, devotes the rest of his life to living out a true faith. And so what it is that he writes on here today is something that I think is extremely important for us to get around, this idea of false faith. Um, in this passage, James talks about the difference between real and counterfeit Jesus followers. He talks about how you can have a true faith. Now, to be honest, this verse that we're going to look at today is probably the most controversial and misunderstood passages in the book of James. Um, every cult loves to grab a hold of this one. Uh, and in fact, what it is that I'm going to talk to you about today, I really want you to get so that when those guys come knocking on your door, you'll be able to have a, a real conversation with them about what real faith is and to show that you don't have to earn your way into heaven. Now, now, uh, it's so important that, that you get what it is that I am, I am talking today about today. Um, for those of you who are just checking this thing out, and you, you're, not, you're not really there on the whole faith thing, you're not even sure what you believe about the whole Jesus stuff, um, I, I just, I'm hoping that you will judge Christianity today by what it is that James and Paul, the two guys who we're going to talk about today, what it is that they say, rather than what it is that you may have experienced in other churches, what it is that you may have experienced from other so-called Jesus followers, um, uh, anybody who is not living completely like Jesus, will you judge the faith based on what it is that is seen here, and, and maybe the heart behind the Christian message? Um, but here is the difficulty of this passage, and, and we're going to wrestle with this. It's a bit of a tension to be managed rather than something to figure out this morning. Um, here is the difficulty of it. What the, what the Apostle Paul, the leader uh, of many different churches, the, the starter of many different churches, the planter, most of the entire New Testament teaches that we are saved by faith alone. By grace, through faith, you are saved. But then James comes along and he throws this giant kind of wrench into things. And he says, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. And some of you are like, ah, uh, what's it? Uh, uh, where, where is the, what? How do those two things actually even line up? They seem to be contradicting each other, don't they? But in fact, man, they are both right. They're just talking about two different things. Paul was fighting the problem of legalism, the problem of I've got to keep all of the Jewish laws and I've got to do all of the right things and I've got to every, get everything right. And so he is dealing with, with uh, legalism. That's what it is that he's trying to fight. Whereas James, he's not trying to fight that at all. He's trying to fight laziness. Uh, those who say, well, it doesn't matter what it is that you do as long as you believe everything will be okay. And they're fighting two different enemies here. They both use the word works in two different ways. When Paul uses the word works, he's talking about Jewish laws. And when James uses the word works here, he's actually talking about what it is that you should be doing as a result of your salvation. See, James focuses on the fruit of salvation, what it is that happens outside. And Paul, what it is that he's talking about is what's going on inside. 
that, that Paul is talking about how you know you're a Christian, and James is talking about how you show that you're a Christian. Paul is talking about this passages on faith alone, how to become a believer. James is talking about how to behave like a believer. It's not a contradiction. They work together. And it's summed up in Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 10. For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith, for a life of good works that has already been prepared for you in advance to do. That there are three prepositions, I'm an old English teacher, bear with me, three prepositions here that we got to work with, by grace, through faith, for good works. And if you get those things out of order, grace, faith, works. If you try to switch one in front of the other, it doesn't work anymore. We're not saved for works to get faith so we might receive grace. That is just wrong. You tracking with me? He's saying we receive grace. We stretch in our faith and we begin to do the good works that God has called for us to do. But how do you, how do you show that you are a true believer? How should my identity as a true child, child of God, be expressed. Now, some people think it's by what it is that you say. Uh, true faith is not, though, something that you just say. <laughs> uh, what good is it, my brother, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? It doesn't say he actually has faith. It says he claims to have faith. He talks about it. He knows all the right phrases. He knows the correct things to say. There are lots of people who claim to be Christians, right? In fact, 50 million North Americans claim that they've had a born-again experience with Jesus Christ. But they aren't acting like it. They don't, live, you don't see it in their lifestyle. Today, we tend to label people as Christians if they make the lightest, slightest sound of being a, a believer. But it's more than just talk in regards to our faith. Um, uh, not everybody, Jesus said this, and, and it keeps me up a little bit at night, and maybe it should you as well. Jesus said, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody with a Christian bumper sticker is getting in. Not, talk is cheap. Heck, Larry Flint uh, some of you may know him, unfortunately. The publisher of Hustler magazine said that he was born again. And then he just continued to make pornography, continued to enslave people with what it is that he was putting out there. No difference in Larry's life whatsoever. No change. Talk is cheap. And is my identity then as a real believer expressed by something that you feel? I mean, a lot of people confuse emotions and what it is that's going on inside with what it is that is true. And you can be emotionally moved and actually never act on it. You can go to church, you can have an emotional reaction, you get the goosebumps, you start feeling good, you walk out of here and you go back to living the exact same life that you've always lived. See, James that then gives an illustration. He says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? I, I saw a, a Peanuts cartoon. I loved Snoopy. I loved Charlie Brown growing up. I know, uh, dating myself. But there was this one that I saw one time. And uh, Linus and, and Charlie are, are having this discussion. They're looking outside at, at Snoopy, who's freezing cold, and his dog dish is empty. And so they decide to go and do something about it. And so they walk out, they put on all of their clothes, and they walk outside to the cold. And, and they look at, at Snoopy, and they say to Snoopy, um, Snoopy, be of good cheer. <laughs> then they turn around and walk back inside, having done nothing. And I was like, oh, man, where, where did the, where'd Charles, Charles Schultz get this? verse or get this idea from it's from this verse it's like uh, um, I some if you see somebody in need and you say ah oh, man I feel for you ah, good luck uh, are you really walking out the love of God it's more than just feelings if after church you're, you're getting into your car and, and you happen to slam all 10 fingers in your car you, you managed to do it it was difficult but you figured it out and then I walked out, and I saw you, and, and there's blood dripping off of your hands, and all of your fingers are broken. And I look at you, and I go, man, I hope you really figure out how to open up your car door and get to the hospital. I'll be praying for you. <laughs> and I take off. It's like, what the heck? No, we would never do that. And yet, man, we do it all the time. 
We do it all the time. True faith is more than just sympathy and feeling and emotion. You do something about it. You act on it. True faith takes the initiative. It gets involved in people's lives. John, 1 John 3.17 says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? And we justify it all the time. We go, ah, oh, man, that person, you know, they, they've got that, that struggle with that thing that they're dealing with. And so I just don't want to enable them. I don't want to give to them. I don't want to, man, there's a reason that they're in the trouble right now. They need to feel that pinch. They need to feel what, how stupid they were because they slammed their fingers in their car door. They just need to live in that for a little while. It's like, ah, actually, I'm not responsible for them. I am responsible for me. And so when I just brush people generally, rather than stopping and getting to the truth of what it is that's going on in their life, and finding out what's going on, and seeing if I can make a difference, I love the way Andy Stanley says it. He, he says something along the lines of, what if you could do for the one that you wish you could do for the everyone? What if we lived a life like that? See, faith is generous at its core. God so loved the world because he gave, and as a result of that, we want to give. Um, who can count on you in a crisis? Who can count on you in a crisis? How many people have the freedom to call you in, in the middle of the night when something is going wrong? You, you'll know how many people can count on you by how many calls you've received in the past. Who calls you? Do they know they can? See, faith is not just feeling. One of the proofs that Jesus is in us is that we love and we are available to love. That, that we're a lot better at verbalizing our faith. How many of you recognize that? We're a lot better at talking about our faith than actually living out our faith. Is there anybody else who struggles with that personally? Only five or six of you. The rest of you are amazing liars. That is awesome. Way to go. We struggle with this. How do we walk the walk? See, James says that if faith doesn't lead me to share with others, then what kind of faith is it? it he says in verse 17, in the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by actions. Sorry, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by actions, is dead. And you, you, should, you should question. This is getting a little awkward here this morning, but I'm okay with that because I'm going You should question if there is the life of Jesus in you if you are not acting like Jesus. He's putting on the line here. He's saying, you, you want true faith? It's more than just something you say. It's more than just something you feel. Well, what, but what about true faith? It's something you think, right? Well, for some people, faith is an intellectual trip in and of itself. A matter to be studied, debated, thought about, uh, d discussed back and forth over and over again. James imagines this intellectual objector, has a little uh, conversation he says here. Uh, someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. He's imagining this intellectual guy who's just kind of like, you're into faith, I'm into works, that's cool, you be you, I'll be me. Right? Let's debate it. You've got your thing, I've got mine. Teach his own. You can, st you can stimulate me mentally, but don't ever ask me to get involved missionally. The guy with real faith says, man, show me your faith without deeds. I'll show you my faith by what it is that I do. True faith is visible. You can see it. If you claim to be a Christian, people even outside of the faith, they should be able to see it. It's visible. If you claim to be a Christian, I have a right to ask you to prove it by looking at your lifestyle. Somebody said, faith is like calories. You can't see them, but you sure see the results. <laughs> I never understood what they were saying. <laughs> Maybe you can't see faith, but you can see the results of faith. True faith is more than something that you think. It's more than something that you say. It's more than something you feel. 
or think. You can actually prove it. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Anytime a person becomes a Christian, he becomes a new person inside. The old things have passed away. All things become new. Now, not overnight, but they start becoming new. There's a change that begins to happen inside of your life. And if a change isn't happening inside of your life, then maybe your identity is not in Jesus. If you grab onto a live 220 volt wire, you know it. <laughs> and I sometimes question, I don't see how somebody as big as God, as amazing as Jesus, all powerful, all knowing, all places at all times, can enter into your life and then it not affect you dramatically. If it doesn't change, if nothing changes in you, there's a question. Is he really in there then? Have you given him everything then? What, what I can see in my life, what can I see in my life that should prove it? I, I love Jimmy, Jimmy Carter's book. Uh, he wrote a book called Why Not the Best? Um, I love what it is that this guy did in terms of humanitarian aid, in terms of political uh, unrest. He, he, he has a quote in here one time uh, that says, one of the things that was a turning point in his life was when somebody asked him the question, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? It's a good question. Makes me a little uncomfortable at times. See, true faith always produces change. You'll see some changes in your life. True faith is not just something you say or, or do or, or think or feel. There's something deeper. It's not even just something that you believe. You're like, oh, what are you, what, are you serious, Frank? What are you? you believe that there is one God good. Even the demons believe that and shudder is one verse. See, there are a lot of people who have strong beliefs in God about the Bible, about Jesus. They can recite creeds to you and doctrines and prayers and, and quote Bible verses. And James says, big deal. Just saying that you believe in God is not enough. The devil believes in God. The, the devil is a great theologian. He knows a lot more of the Bible than you probably do. He's been around a whole lot longer. He can quote theology backwards and forwards. I mean, he believes in Jesus. He knows Jesus. His demons think about Jesus and they shudder because of how well they actually know Jesus. They understand his awe, his power, his majesty. They get it. And for many of us, Jesus is just a thing that's kind of like he's the tag along. James is saying that belief is not enough. You say you're a Christian, prove it. Let me see your actions that back up your words. If I say I believe my health is important, let's, let's just, let's just like, um, uh, let's, uh, what's it called? Or you just sort of like make something up as you're talking about it? Let, what? Thank you. Let's be hypothetical. Let's say that I was to say I believe that my physical health is ultra important. And then you came up to me and you said, okay, Frank, uh, tell me about what it is that you ate this week. Oh. Uh, so how did you exercise this week? Ooh. How about your vitamins? Are you aware of that? Uh, when was the last time you went to see the doctor? What is it that's actually going on in your life to prove that you are saying your health is vitally important to you? And that would be fair of them to ask me, wouldn't it? If I'm saying that my health is important to me, it would be okay for them to ask me a few questions to see if that actually backs it up, wouldn't it be? <laughs> see, um, we all know what counts is my actions as a result of what it is that I believe. The word believe that James uses here is the Greek word which means to trust in, to cling to, to completely rely on, and to commit yourself wholeheartedly to. You are a Christian as a result of your belief in Jesus, but your belief is supposed to be something more than head knowledge. Some say, I, I believe in God, and James says, big deal, what do you do as a result of it? Everybody believes in God. How do you have a, a creation without a creator? Lots of people believe in God. But have you committed yourself completely and totally to Jesus? To a true faith. 
Because it's not just something you say. It's not think, believe, whatever. We know it's something that you do. In the next couple of verses, James, he gives two illustrations to show the difference between faith being something that you actually do and faith not being something. Uh, Faith is active. It's not passive. It's a commitment that leads to compassion, to action. And two illustrations of two very different people. He gives us this, this idea of Abraham on one side and Rahab on the other side. Two exact opposites in the, in the ways of life, if we're honest. I mean, Abraham, this patriarchal father figure, right? And Rahab, this woman, prostitute. The, the low of the low in the eyes of the religious, um, and he uses these two illustrations. He says, doesn't matter who you are as long as you've got the, the important thing. They had the one thing in common. That was faith. Real, true faith. Their faith in God led them to something. Verse 20, he says, you foolish men. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? His faith and actions were working together. His faith was made complete by what it is that he did. Scripture was fulfilled when it said Abraham believed in God. Well, how do we actually know it? How do we know he believed in God? Well, we saw it. He behaved as though God had complete control over his life. Abraham believed God, and it was accredited to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Now, some of you know the story. It is the ultimate test of faith, where God asks Abraham to give up his own son. Man, this had nothing to do with salvation, though, did it? Abraham was already going to heaven. 25 years earlier, God counted him as righteous. He's not talking about being saved uh, by works. What he's talking about here is that action shows true faith. Abraham obeyed God. And if I can challenge you with anything here this morning, it is true faith looks like obeying God. Sometimes when we know it, sometimes when we don't, sometimes when we're like, oh man, I'm not really sure this is in the Bible, but I don't don't really know. Jesus said this, but mm, I don't really know. I really feel like I'm supposed to, but uh, I don't... uh." Believe and obey. Be baptized and obey. This is a a life that we're supposed to walk into of when I give my life to Jesus, I give over the steering wheel, I give over the reins, I give over control. And my job now is just to obey. I mean, Abraham obeyed. It was immediate. He took his son up. He did all of those faith steps. He cut the wood. He built an altar. He was ready to sacrifice his son, and it sounds sick to us. But Abraham says to his son while walking up the mountain, we'll return. He didn't say, I will return. He had such a faith that he knew that if God was going to ask him to do this, God would come through. Whether it was staying his hand and stopping it, or after he sacrificed him, raising his son from the dead. Because God is love. And when he asks you to do something, he's got a plan for you inside of it. Then James talks about Rahab. The original story is in Joshua 2. You should go and read it sometimes. I love the Bible. Man, the more you get into it, the more good it is. The more good it is for you. Even when you feel like you don't necessarily are getting anything out of it, the Holy Spirit is doing something in you. Dig into it again. This story in Joshua 2 is the story of how this prostitute named Rahab actually helped a couple of spies, a couple of Israel spies, God's spies, come in and get what it is that they needed to in in regards to Jericho. And it was fascinating. And as a result of what it is that she did for God, Rahab actually ends up in the family line of Jesus. That what we have to begin to understand is as we are faithful and we act on it, that there are generational consequences. That, that there were intention, intentional blessings coming. God was organizing things, and she may not have even understood what the heck she was doing. But when you are faithful and you act on it, God moves. See, our faith is not determined by what we do. It's demonstrating 
It's demonstrated by what it is that we do. Your identity is a faithful, obedient child of God whom he loves and adores. You can be completely forgiven, completely in Christ. But then it's actually time to act like it. God says to you, man, talk is cheap. Put your, put your money, put your time, put your energy, put your life where your mouth is. You say, I believe in Jesus. That's cool. Prove it. Our faith is demonstrated by our actions. Actions speak louder than words. Show me. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Check yourself out. See if you're really a believer or not. Do, do you live from your head? I, I know. I believe. Does that actually shift to your heart? Yeah, there's a change that happens inside of me. I receive love. I receive healing. I receive forgiveness. And after head, heart, it moves to the hands where you actively live out a life that is completely submitted to Jesus. So many people think it doesn't really matter what it is that you do as long as you believe. And James says, you know what? That's just not true. Hear me, hear me when I'm saying this. He, he, is, he is not saying you work your way to heaven. He's not saying works delivers salvation. He's saying works demonstrates your faith. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith for a life of good works that God has already prepared for us to do. God's grace, God reaches down and says, you know what, you don't deserve this, but I'm going to give it to you. And you reach up and say, Father, I don't deserve your mercy, but I'm desperately asking for it. And I just want to die to the old me, and I want to live for Jesus. I want to live a life of a true faith. That's, that's how salvation occurs. See, some of you... You're not here today by accident. Some of you, you got doubts on whether it is that you're a believer or not. Um, you're a good person. You try to live life as best as you can. Uh, you maybe even gone to church a few times. Maybe even you believe in some sort of higher power. You think that there's something else there. That you think. And, and maybe even some of you, you've, you've been introduced to Jesus before, introduced to the Bible. You've had religion in your life, and, and you've gone to classes, and you've checked off the boxes, and you've done the things that you're supposed to do. But we're not talking about religion. Jesus said, I, I never knew you. We're actually talking about relationship. So if you're here this morning and maybe you're wrestling with doubts on whether or not your faith is a true faith or a counterfeit, man, I'm so thankful that you're here because you don't have to leave here the same way you walked in. There can be a shift. There can be a, a, a change, a, a commitment to receiving love from God and allowing him to pour that love into you so that your, so that your life might be an overfill of the love that Jesus pours into you. See, it becomes about religion when you're just doing the checkboxes, but it's about relationship when the love of Jesus is so great in you that it spills out into every capacity in which you find yourself. Rhonda talked about that today at our huddle. It was really good. Where knowing God helps us recognize that we need to grow in God, and then it just doesn't stay there. We actually move to a love that goes with God into a world that desperately needs it, desperately needs him, desperately needs hope. For some of you, maybe you're, you're in here and you're like, oh man, you're just feeling the weight of it. I remember, I remember being in those seats. I remember it when I felt the weight of my hypocrisy land on me for the first time. And to be very clear, it lands on me all the time now. But now I'm just aware of what it is that I should do with it. Where God so loves me exactly as I am that he loves me so much that he isn't willing to let me stay there either. Where he says, okay, it's time to make a change. And really walking in the Christian faith is just daily asking God, what do you have for me? I want to be obedient to it. Father, what do you have for me today? 
Father, I, I screwed up yesterday. Please forgive me. I want to start fresh. Allow me the freedom and the power to change so that today I might walk with you in every step that I take. Maybe some of you are here today and you're like, I, I've never even experienced this. How, what, how do I, what, what is it that's involved in this? Well, you can start with a prayer. But to be very clear, I know way too many people who prayed a prayer once and think that that's faith. It's not, as we learned today. It's a starting place. It's a launch pad. I'm going to pray. Maybe you want to join me in it. Jesus Christ, I want to give you every area of my life. And as best as I know how, I am just saying, no more me, more of you. I want to give myself fully and completely to you. I want to learn more about you, God. I give you my past, all of the stupid choices that I have made, all the times where I've denied you just by walking like I'm not with you. Will you just forgive me for that? I ask you to take it all, my life, the dysfunction, the issues, the problems, everything that is currently facing me, you get it all. I want to change. I want to be made new. I'm going to, from this day forward, just ask you to make me new, that I might rely on you in every situation that I'm in. Will you help me to grow? Will you help me deal with my past? Will you help me uh, find a, a sense of healing from the dysfunction that I've sowed into my life in the past? Take my life fully and completely and make me new. Let the past be behind me. Let the future be ahead of me, a future with you where I'm in daily submission to a life where I get to obey you. Help me grow. Help me to know that you want to change me. Help me to become more like your son. And help me show it in my life. Give me ways that I can obey Give me opportunities to stretch my faith, to flex my faith. Help me be aware of how it is that the Holy Spirit is going to prompt me and then give me the energy and the drive and the desire to want to be obedient to you. I want a true faith. Please empower me for that, Jesus. In your name, amen. amen. You know, if... if uh, if you prayed that prayer recently, maybe, where you just, you just said, I, I don't want to live for me anymore. I want to live fully and completely for Jesus. Then one, of the, one of the first steps of obedience is to be baptized. When you are ready to give it all over to God, when you are like, I want to die to the old me, that's really what it is that baptism represents. Dying, you go into the water, the old you, you come up, out, different. Kind of like what Jesus did. Jesus went into the grave and was there, and he came up out of the grave different. Baptism is a great way to symbolize that, and it's a first step of obedience. We're going to have some baptisms next week. Uh, for those of you who are like, man, I, as best as I know how, I don't have it all figured out, but I want to live for Jesus, and I recommend you be baptized. Um, you can sign up at the info booth uh, as you're heading out, and uh, somebody will contact you, and then next week, we're doing some baptisms. Is it next week? Somebody confirm that for me? It is. Uh, that's exciting. Oh, I'm bummed I'm missing it. <laughs> Stupid Africa. No, I'm going to be great too, there too. It's, uh, somebody will video it. Um, if you have, have found any sort of, of benefit in, in these sessions on identity theft, then maybe ask God who it is that you think might benefit from this as well. Who it is that you can invite uh, to be a part of, of seeing them become themselves again, the true self that Jesus would have for them. Have a fantastic two and a half weeks. Go and be a blessing while I'm gone. Be blessed.